I'm meeting with Renee Dancer of Harvard's Access to Justice Lab, and I'm grateful for the time that you've given us today, and especially because of the information that we're going to discuss and the a topic we're going to discuss, and that is, as I understand it, a study among many that the Access to Justice Lab conducts uh, on uh, issues of people being able to access the courts more easily, less expensively, uh, but with greater convenience. Uh, and just before we went uh, live, where we talked about a little bit about making sure that the people don't have to come back to court as often as another aspect of access to justice. So I'm grateful that you're here to talk to us today. And before we begin, would, just, would you like to give the viewers just a brief profile of yourself and what the Access to Justice Lab is? Sure. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, the Access to Justice Lab at Harvard Law School, we conduct rigorous evaluations in the uh, legal system to understand what works and what doesn't. Um, we also try to promote the use of evidence to make, uh, to make decisions in the justice system uh, when implementing new programs designed to improve access to justice. Some people, uh, including yourself, may not know how I came to find out about you, but that was because in Utah, as a lot of viewers may or may not know here in Utah, after the COVID epidemic or pandemic, excuse me, we started spending a lot more time uh, with access to justice uh, through remote means where people would uh, appear virtually rather than in person in court in an effort to avoid spreading the uh, disease. And so uh, as I met, as I happened to see in one of my uh, uh, articles I, re I read in researching this was that uh, Roscoe Pound said in 1906 that our system of justice is archaic, and I was like, uh, and but then also that they said in uh, in legal terms we have gone a mile uh, in advancement in the space of one inch of time because the legal uh, the legal profession and the legal system is generally very very resistant to change, and so this was a a huge leap uh, when it comes to what we were willing to do and change in such a short period of time. And so I found out that although we are going back to court more often in Utah and that the uh, remote proceedings are reducing in frequency, uh, that Harvard is doing a study in, that includes Utah and the domestic relations commissioners uh, dealing with, correct me if I'm wrong, pro se litigants and then the access to court proceedings and participation through remote means like televideo uh, without having to be, appear in person in the courthouse or in the courtroom. That's correct, yes. All right, so what was the purpose of the study? Why, why even conduct the study in the first place? Well, I think you really touched on it. So the, as, as courts are emerging from the pandemic operations, which were kind of put together really quickly and courts responded very quickly, I totally agree with you in that assessment to, and, and remote, Proceedings and remote appearances were a staple in order to address the health concerns of being of gathering in a in a courtroom. Uh, and so then, as we were emerging from the pandemic and having to make the decision about whether or not to come back in person, um, as we had done prior to the pandemic, or to keep some of these innovations that we uh, implemented going forward, we wanted to do an evaluation to understand if the medium of proceeding uh, makes a difference in such a way in family law matters for self-represented litigants that would compel us to keep that medium or conversely, if there's um, room to keep both options available. Did the people conducting the study come into it with some concerns or was this kind of a tabula rasa blank slate sort of thing saying we have no preconceptions, we just want to uh, ask some questions and inform ourselves or was it a little bit of both? No, I think it's a little bit of both. So we usually at the Access to Justice Lab, we usually have a hypothesis for every study, right? What we think the results will be. Um, but this study is a little different and because it really is um, one that is meant to be responsive to the di to the discourse going on around the country, right? So there is disagreement, and there are there are plenty of arguments in both camps whether we should return to the status quo prior to the pandemic, or if we should maintain the status quo during the pandemic, or if there's some um, middle solution or hybrid solution. 
Could you just, for the benefit of people that aren't aware, uh, for example, that you can appear remotely in many Utah domestic relations proceedings, what some of the benefits and some of the detriments of appearing remotely are, just generally? Yeah, so, I mean, the literature will tell you that some benefits can include that it is um, more convenient, um, so you can appear from any location that is convenient to yourself. Um, some some folks will suggest that if there is um, an issue of domestic or intimate partner violence, that it may be a safer um, solution for folks to appear uh, remotely if if necessary. Uh, there's there's some additional convenience factors that some folks put out there as as existing, like not needing to find childcare or not needing to access transportation when transportation is a challenge for folks to get get to the courthouse. All of those um, benefits can also have a converse drawback. So some people don't have adequate broadband access. And so they have no choice but to travel somewhere to access broadband. And so that kind of eliminates- Yeah, that's, that's like, yeah, I don't have to go to the courthouse. I just have to go across town to where I can get onto a camera and right. broadband access. Okay, that's convenient true. convenient location altogether, yeah. um, but it might, it might be similar. Um, there may not actually be a realization of not needing childcare. It is challenging to conduct a court hearing whether you're in the courtroom or not, and when you also need to exercise your parent duties, right? So, so that can that may cut both ways. And there's also some research about um, whether or not the medium um, affects the the trier of facts ability to make judgment calls about the the folks before them. When we think about, um, I will say <clears throat> that that the research is is fairly clear that that it's a it's a we don't know right like we don't know there's no like sure thing that the trier of fact is making negative judgment calls or positive judgment calls. yeah and because because in these sorts of studies what we can't do is just is is clear the memory bank of the commissioner and say all right now do it again and this time the people that you were on camera will be in front of you and we're going to see what the difference is we have to just kind of extrapolate from what we could see uh, for dealing with different people. It's like, well, we notice these patterns when pro se litigants show up on camera, as opposed to pro se litigants that appear before you personally in your in your courtroom. But still, what do you see happening? What what, what do you see any uh, any uh, any any meaningful statistics about the differences between appearing personally and remotely? Well, so in this evaluation, we're really looking at whether or not the case outcomes are a little bit different. So we're wondering if the media makes a difference for people's ability to resolve their cases quicker. <laughs> and we want to understand if their court orders are more durable. And so these are family law matters, um, oftentimes can be modified or enforced at a later date. And sometimes um, you can judge kind of the durability of a court order by how quickly that action happens. And so that's what we're looking at. Does someone, uh, or does the time from the uh, dispository order, the dispositive order to the um, first modification or enforcement request, does that increase, right? Does that make those orders more meaningful. Um, so we are still enrolling participants and we will do that through September of this year. And then we'll begin analysis of the data. So we, we, we're kind of in the middle of the study. So we can't really, we don't have data to share at this time. So is it then you're trying to see just, uh, are you trying to see if there's a trade-off between convenience and consistency? Would that be accurate or is that not something this study is tracking? Yeah, you know, we actually aren't looking. Um, so we have a few survey questions that we ask participants. It's voluntary, so they don't um, they don't have to take the survey. So we don't have necessarily we aren't going to come away with knowing exactly um, kind of like the the feeling of the public um, about the the hearings. But it's not necessarily about the questions don't necessarily get to convenience themselves. There are a few questions. One of them is, would you have rather done this in the other way, right? Um, uh -huh. 
So you might consider that to be a convenience question. You could intuit some convenience out of that. Um, but we aren't necessarily assessing convenience. We really are wanting to know, does the medium affect substantive case outcomes, right? Do substantive case outcomes change as a result of this? You might think that substantive case outcomes change because uh, people can participate more readily, they feel more comfortable participating, and you could think of that as convenience, perhaps. I see. Well, I appreciate that, and I know that your time is precious, and so I don't have any other questions. You've done a very good job of, of laying it out, giving us a clear overview. Is there anything else that you think uh, people might find surprising or particularly helpful about this, uh, about these questions that this study is uh, is exploring? You know, I think that um, you know our, my hypothesis from for this study going into it is that we aren't going to necessarily see a clear winner. That we're going to come away with um, real evidence that perhaps providing the option to folks is available is better is the best solution to to participate remotely or participate um, in person. That's just what I think will happen. I won't know until we're done, so stay tuned to see. Um, but I was very happy to share with you today this conversation and really happy to have anyone you know, reach out to me and I'm happy to talk more. I appreciate that. One, one final question that I should have asked earlier is like, are they polling uh, the litigants or do they also pull the commissioners that are involved as well? So we have the surveys are just litigants based surveys. Now we have been meeting with the commissioners um, periodically throughout the study and we chat, we talk with them, you know, about their their feelings and what their opinions are as well. Uh, and we also talk have been talking with other courtroom staff like clerks and bailiffs as well. And to some degree, we have, um, you know, we've introduced the topic to the bar who practices in front of these commissioners, but we haven't necessarily solicited their feedback yet, but that um, doesn't mean it's not coming. Great. So this ends in September, if all goes as planned. Is that correct? That's when the study ends? That's when the um, enrollment of participants ends, and then we'll do data analysis after that. So we do need to, we are going to follow cases for about a year after they've come into the study, just because of the nature of these types of cases, they aren't necessarily quick resolvers to begin with. That's very interesting. Thank you so much. We appreciate you t taking the time with us to talk about this study and answer questions. And I hope that our viewers come away from that knowing a little bit more about the option of appearing remotely in Utah yeah. domestic relations cases and about some of the concerns that uh, surround that so they can have a better experience themselves and be better prepared. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you, Eric.